ME204, Mass Moment of Inertia. Newton's second law says that for translating objects, forces cause masses to accelerate, and we write that as F equals M times A. What happens when we have rotating objects? Well, typically we look at a rotating force as a moment or a torque. A rotating acceleration would be an angular acceleration. So what do we put in place of the mass? This is what we call the mass moment of inertia, which is also the second moment of the mass. So for translating objects, we have force equals mass times acceleration. And for rotating objects, we have that a moment is equal to the mass moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So what is inertia? Inertia is a resistance to change. An object in motion wants to stay in motion unless it's acted on by another force. So what is the mass moment of inertia? Well, we know that a moment implies rotation, and inertia is resistance to change. So a mass moment of inertia would be rotational inertia, or resistance to rotational changes. And it's a mass's resistance to rotational changes. To understand mass moments of inertia, we need to talk more about what a moment is. In fact, we need to talk about what a first, second, and third moment is. The first moment of a force we learned about in statics. You'll remember that a moment is found by multiplying the force by a distance once. So if I've got this wrench and I'm pushing on it at 90 degrees with 50 pounds and I have a moment arm of 0.75 feet, then the first moment is equal to that force times the distance, or 50 times 0.75, which would give me 37.5 pound-feet. If I want to find the second moment of the force, I simply multiply by the distance twice. In this case, the second moment would be the force times the distance squared, or 50 times 0.75 squared, which would be 28.1 pound-feet squared. If I want the third moment of the force, then I multiply by the distance three times, or in this case, the force times the distance cubed. We would have 50 pounds times 0.75 feet cubed, which would give us 21.1 pound feet cubed. Can we take moments of other things besides forces? Absolutely, yes. In fact, as we move further on in the course, we're going to take moments of momentum. This is how we calculate angular momentum. We take momentum, which is a mass times a velocity, and multiply it by a perpendicular distance d. We've also taken moments of area. You might remember this from your statics class. The first moment of the area is an area times its distance. We use that to find centroids of an object. So a mass moment of inertia is simply the second moment of the mass. If I've got a mass out on a string at a radius r and it's pivoting about a, a specific pivot point, then my mass moment of inertia is equal to the second moment of the mass, which would be my mass, times the moment arm squared, or mr squared. What if the mass is not all located at the same place? Now let's say I've got these four different masses, m1, m2, m3, and m4, at different radiuses, r1, r2, r3, and r4, respectively. Well, to find that mass moment of inertia, I simply add each of the individual mass moments of inertia together. So in this case, my mass moment of inertia is m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared plus m3 r3 squared plus m4 r4 squared. What if the mass is all located the same distance from the center? For example, I have a whole bunch of masses, but they're all located the same distance. In fact, maybe there's so many of them that they're all collected together at the same distance. In this case, maybe we have a thin ring. Well, all the masses are the same distance, so we can sum all the masses together and multiply it by the radius. Or, for a thin ring, our mass moment of inertia is equal to mass times the radius squared. What if there are four rings that are stuck together? In this case, ring 1, ring 2, ring 3, and ring 4. Well, we would find this by adding the mass moments of inertia for each specific ring m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared plus m3 r3 squared plus m4 r4 squared. What if the object is a flat disk, it has an infinite number of rings? In this case, again, we could add all of those rings together, but if we've got an infinite number of rings that we're trying to add together, what's a quicker way that we do that? How do we add up an infinite number of infinitely small things? Well, we integrate. And in this case, our mass moment of inertia is equal to the integral of the radius squared dm. 
which is our mass times our radius squared, but we're looking at an infinitely small mass for each ring. Well, we know that density is equal to mass divided by a volume. So density times a small volume would be equal to a small mass. If we have a thickness t, then our density is equal to a thickness t times a small area, which is equal to our small mass. If our area of one of these thin rings, if we take that thin ring and lay it out flat, then we have a length of a rectangle that would be 2 pi r in length with a thickness of dr, which would give us an area, 2 pi r dr. And if we say that the thickness of the ring is equal to 1, then we can substitute this into our equation and get that our mass moment of inertia is density times 2 pi times the integral of r cubed dr. Integrating that, we get that the mass moment of inertia is equal to the density times 2 pi r to the fourth divided by 4, or density times pi r squared times r squared over 2. However, density times pi r squared is just equal to our mass. So substituting mass back into the equation, we get that for a flat disk, our mass moment of inertia is equal to 1 half the mass times the radius squared. Now we can figure this out for a lot of different shapes, but in most cases there are common shapes that these equations have been derived for. We already talked about a thin ring, the mass moment of inertia for a thin ring about the z-axis, in this case, would be mr squared. For a thin disk about the z-axis, it would be 1 half mr squared. A slender rod about the z-axis, we're assuming because it's slender, the mass is concentrated around that z-axis. So around the z-axis, the mass moment of inertia is zero. But about the x-axis or the y-axis, our mass moment of inertia is 1 twelfth ml squared. We can also find it for a thin plate where our mass moment of inertia about the z-axis would be 1 twelfth the mass times x squared plus y squared, in this case where x squared and y squared are the squares of the lengths of the rectangle. Now we can find the mass moment of inertia about other axes as well. So for a thin ring, our mass moment of inertia about the x or y axes is 1 half mr squared. For a thin disk, it's 1 fourth mr squared. And for a thin plate, it's 1 twelfth mx squared about the x-axis, or 1 twelfth my squared about the y-axis. So which equation do I use? In this case, we've got a flat disk. If I want to know the mass moment of inertia about the y-axis, then that's finding it as if it were rotating in that direction. If I want it about the z-axis, which is coming out of the page, then it's rotating in this direction. So depending on how the object is going to rotate, we calculate the mass moment of inertia differently. What if I have a composite shape? We want to find the mass moment of inertia about an axis coming out of the page located at the center of this shape. Well, in this case, we simply find the mass moment of inertia of the square as if there were no hole in it. Then we subtract the mass moment of inertia of the hole in the center. That would give us the mass moment of inertia of the composite shape. What if the object isn't rotating about its center? In that case, we use what's called the parallel axis theorem. The mass moment of inertia about some point O is equal to the mass moment of inertia about the center of gravity plus the mass times the distance from the center of gravity to the point of interest squared. I sub zero is the moment of inertia about a different point. This would be the moment of inertia about the center of gravity. M is the mass of the object, and D is the distance from the center of gravity to the new point. Here's an example. A thin disk rotating about its center. We can find the mass moment of inertia for a thin disk. We know that that equation is 1 half mr squared about the center of gravity. Substituting in what we know with a mass of 3 kilograms and a radius of 0.5 meters, we could calculate the mass moment of inertia about the center of gravity as 0.375 kilograms meters squared. But what if the thin disk is rotating about a different point, in this case a point on the top of the disk? We would use the parallel axis theorem to calculate this. So the mass moment of inertia about point O is equal to the mass moment of inertia about the center of gravity plus the mass times the distance squared. We know that the mass moment of inertia about the center of gravity is 0.375 as calculated from the previous piece of this example, plus our mass, 3 kilograms, times the distance from the center of gravity to the point that we're interested in. In this case, it would just be equal to the radius, which is 0.5. So we've got 0.375 
plus 3 times 0.5 squared would give us the mass moment of inertia about 0 0.0, which is, in this case, 1.125 kilograms meter squared. Now let's talk about a radius of gyration. This is called an equivalent radius. Let's say you have an 8 kilogram rod that is 2 meters long. If we wanted to calculate the mass moment of inertia for this rod, we could use our equation 1 12th ml squared. Plugging in what we know, 8 kilograms and 2 meters and squaring that, we would get that our mass moment of inertia is 2.67 kilograms meters squared. Well, what if this were equal to some thin ring? What if we had the same amount of mass and we wanted to know what's the radius for a thin ring that has the same mass moment of inertia and the same mass? Well, we know that the equation for mass moment of inertia for a thin ring is the simplest equation that we have. It's just I equals mr squared, or in this case, I equals mk squared. If we rearrange that equation, we can find that equivalent radius, k, to be equal to the square root of our mass moment of inertia for the rod divided by its mass. This k is our radius of gyration. We use the radius of gyration because it makes the calculation simpler for more complex shapes. In this case, our radius of gyration would be 0.58 after we divide 2.67 by 8 kilograms and take the square root. So let's use the radius of gyration to find the mass moment of inertia of an I-beam. Let's say we have an I-beam that we want to buy. It's 200 pounds and we want to use it as a rotating shaft. Well, We go to the vendor and he says, oh, the radius of gyration for this object is 0 0.75 feet. We've already calculated that for you. So what would be the mass moment of inertia for that object? We could calculate the mass moment of inertia by assuming that we have a thin ring with the same mass as our I-beam that has a radius k, or 0.75 in this case. What is the mass moment of inertia of a thin ring of radius k? Well, I is equal to mk squared. Very simple equation, much more simple than trying to calculate our I-beam. So our mass is 200 divided by 32.2 times our radius of gyration, 0.75 squared, or in this case, 3.5 slug feet squared. If we were to calculate this for the I-beam, we would have to calculate all of the composite shapes and add them together. Using radius of gyration, we simply use the equation for a thin ring to calculate our mass moment of inertia. Our next topic is the equation of motion for rigid bodies rotating about a fixed axis.